so much. Uh, very good morning. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much for our first speaker, Dr. Firdaus, uh, and also uh, Professor York Lesman. Um, my job is not really to make to extend the so-called, you know, very nice picture of injuries from snake bite and so on, but perhaps to give a bit of hope uh, in terms of uh, our response to snake bite and venoming uh, in our region, uh, particularly in Malaysia and uh, the surrounding area of Southeast Asia. So, uh, how do I move the cursor? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so this is the overview of my talk. I'm just going to touch a little bit about uh, clinical toxinology as a whole, uh, which is still a very young subspecialty in our region. And um, I think many other ASEAN countries as well. Uh, Snake-related injuries, as Dr. York mentioned, uh, and many others has been telling us yesterday, um, these are actually still occurring on daily basis. Actually, last night we had about four or five cases being consulted to Rex. I uh, was <laughs> in the bedroom and uh, trying to actually go through all these cases as well. So, um, but yet uh, we feel that there are still a lot of underreported, underreporting. Many cases are missed and not being uh, brought to the hospital in time. And therefore, even, even though they were brought to the hospital, as Dr. Yoke showed just now, the patient decided to discharge themselves uh, way earlier than what they should be and uh, could be uh, fatal in the end. Okay, So um, in our uh, area, we, we, are, uh, we used to be working in our own niche in uh, silos, but uh, we feel that over the past 10 years, we feel that that is not really the way to go. We have to break barriers. We have to support each other. And I think that's the whole idea of uh, this week's uh, program is to bring you all the areas that is actually involved with the same topic from various uh, specialties, various experts that should come together and give ideas and share ideas and information. So obviously <laughs> there are so many challenges, uh, but there are also some achievements that we have already uh, noted the past uh, maybe 10 years that we have involved with these cases of snake bites in Malaysia. So we hope that we can share it with you today. So <clears throat> how this thing started? From my own personal experience, uh, the, the big question that we ask is when, uh, where, why do we go into this topic and how should we go into this topic? I started off as have zero knowledge about snake bite. I had a case. Uh, my first case of snake bite was about 10 years ago. Oh no, 15 years ago. And it came to my emergency department and I have no idea what it was. It's just a snake, very colorful. And as you know, uh, somebody said, the more colorful the snake, the more dangerous the snake is. So what I did was I called the National Poison Center. We had a National Poison Center at the time, showed them the picture of a snake, showed them the picture of the patient, and said, oh yeah, can give the antivenom. And guess what? The antivenom that we had stock in my hospital at the time, uh, embarrassed to admit, but it was from India. Okay, so we gave one vial at least. And he said, oh, the patient survived and patient feel well, and therefore maybe the antivan worked. Okay. In the end, I a patient went home well, but I didn't feel well. <laughs> because why? It keeps on nagging to me. Did I give the right thing? Did I do the right thing to this patient? I, I have no idea what the snake was. And thus, the question starts. And this, I think, hopefully, many of you, for you young uh, researchers, young doctors, don't stop asking questions. Very important and follow the questions, follow the lead, uh, look for the experts, and you will find out more. And that's what happened to me. So I got uh, introduced into uh, this area was from mistakes that I made. So I found out later that first, that snake was not venomous. <laughs> Second, why did I give the antivenom? And why did I follow the uh, instruction from uh, so-called, like, you know, the authority national poison center to give antivenom, which was wrong. Okay, and thank God that nothing happened to that patient. So you can imagine if a reaction happened to that patient, I give the wrong antivenom for a non-venomous snake, that will be a medical negligence. Okay, so if we give something correct to the patient, I say the right venom for the right uh, snake diagnosis, and patient did have a reaction, that is not, that is calculated, calculated risk. So that is acceptable. 
but if somebody something you know did the wrong thing, uh, that's just not acceptable. So based on that guilt, I published that paper. <laughs> so you can read that my first case uh, uh, of how we deal with that case. Okay, so we learn from that, and uh, I never stopped since then. So this is my mentor in emergency medicine, Professor Tudoro Heborsa. Uh, he said, "Be a patient's advocate." Uh, we are, if we are doing it for the sake of ourselves, there is no guarantee that we will win or we will succeed, right? But if we will do all these things, it's for our patient's sake, we will always win. So Professor Herbursa is currently uh, the Minister of Health in the Philippines. Okay, so um, I just, uh, I think everybody had mentioned about Rex this morning. So what is Rex? Basically, it's a remote and animation consultancy services, we provide uh, clinical support uh, to all our health uh, professionals in Malaysia and also the region uh, with involvement of Dr. Lau, uh, Dr. Yerk, uh, we, we managed to get Lau also uh, into the picture. Uh, it's a 24 hour on-call consultancy service. This is all purely uh, voluntary, okay? So the consultants are not getting paid for this. Uh, we are just doing it for the sake of our patients, and we receive 24-hour on-call via WhatsApp service, okay? Um, we then uh, provide a standardized guide that we have already published with our Ministry of Health. So we have something solid to follow, and uh, we follow them uh, quite rigorously, uh, even to the details of what uh, details in the history that we ask the patient. So we asked the doctor. So when a, doc <clears throat> when a doctor consulted us, they already have a template of what are the information that need to be done, uh, to be taken, uh, so that they don't miss anything in their documentation. That's very important later when we are doing some research, we're collecting data. So every data that we have after that will be easily uh, extracted from uh, that, the database. <clears throat> so we started in 2010 by just one guy there, uh, receiving call 2, 3 a.m. in the morning, uh, you know, seven days a week. So my wife always complain and she feels that I have a, an affair with the mobile phone. But uh, no, <laughs> it's for the patients. So I decided that, you know, I cannot do this on my own. I have to build up a team. So uh, in Malaysia now, uh, so far we have about 13 uh, consultants all over the country. But we do not just concentrate on one state that we are in. Since it's a remote consultation, we can receive consultation for every call from the country. So if, let's say, I'm here now in Hamburg, uh, I know that my colleagues uh, in Malaysia are actually already uh, receiving the calls and uh, managing the case well, okay? So this is our, uh, what do you call that, uh, flow. As you can see, uh, it's not, uh, uh, popular in the beginning, but over the years, as uh, you know, by word of mouth and so on, uh, especially junior doctors, they find that the service is well, um, is good, and uh, they get more confident in managing patients. So the, we get more and more calls. It doesn't mean that the number of cases uh, of snake bite increases uh, over time in Malaysia. No, the number has always been there, but it's just the service getting more uh, into the mainstream. So we are receiving about uh, approximately about 1,000 cases a year now uh, with consultation. It's getting more after the COVID. During COVID, there's a slight dip. Uh, we haven't analyzed yet. There's still, in uh, 2001, there's still data missing. So they could be about the same as 2020 and 2019. Okay. So in terms of, I said the data, we can now plot. Most of our cases are actually coming from the state of Sarawak, which is on Borneo Island. Uh, and then followed by Pahang, which is the second largest state in Malaysia. So what are the criteria that we use for diagnosis? So when we make a diagnosis, it's important that uh, it's clear is whether there is actually a specimen or no specimen. Okay, so that distinguish whether it's an identified case or unidentified case. And for those who have the specimen, they cannot just say there is a snake bite, no. It has to go down to the level of the species of the snake. And that's where our expertise comes in. We have lies ourselves uh, with herpetologists to help us identify the species 
uh, of each snake. So when we write the diagnosis, it's always with the species name. Okay, so that is also helping us later on with our data collection. Right, so um, uh, many cases actually uh, brought the snake, but uh, some cases do not bring the snake, they just show pictures. Uh, and some of the snakes are alive and also dead. So uh, I had a snake with me, uh, rescued from a patient who brought the snake, and the snake lived with me for about two years before I released back to the wild. Uh, but uh, most of the time, patients do not know what bit them or what species bit them. So the majority of our cases are actually uh, unidentified snake bite. Okay, But this does not mean that we can just easily uh, manage the patient. No, we are actually more concerned for these unidentified cases because we don't know what it is. Therefore, our uh, observation of the patient, our review of the patient's progress, must be more and more detailed, okay? And a closer review pattern, uh, re re review pattern, okay? So uh, this is just a summary of cases, not really that important, but uh, what I want to show you here is that uh, over the period of this, this data collection period, we're about five years, uh, we have only very small number of deaths. Uh, snake bite, uh, there were only uh, five cases, hornet sting, three cases of death, box jellyfish, two cases of death, and tetrodotoxin poisoning, that is from the fugu, uh, pufferfish, okay, and two cases of death. Okay, so um, whether you want to directly extrapolate this number to the uh, service, uh, you can maybe, but I think it's mostly, as you, Dr. Yok mentioned just now, it may not be directly involved, let's say for the snake bite, uh, the death that we had there was mainly because of a secondary infection of necrotizing fasciitis. Okay, not directly so much of the uh, envenoming itself, the primary cause. Uh, one interesting case for this uh, death uh, resound, resound, uh, reflect to the first case present, presented by Dr. Fidaus. Dr. Fidaus uh, presented a case of a Naja Kautia death uh, from someone who had already had previous injury uh, from the Najakauta with surgical or uh, iatrogenic scar. So the case that we had uh, there from this it was a uh, king cobra bite, uh, also from a rescuer, snake handler, uh, fire and rescue department, freshly caught king cobra, uh, four meter long, and he was just playing with it after caught and he got beaten. And that was not the first time he was beaten by a snake. Okay, these people are, I don't know, immune to, to bites maybe. <laughs> uh, we talked to the one before, right? They keep on going. They find it a bit of uh, and, uh, adrenaline junkie stuff, something like that. But uh, they, he also had a similar fasciotomy scar from previous bite. He got bite at the point where this is quite close to the uh, fasciotomy and uh, necrotizing fasciitis developed very fast. He had uh, symptomatic uh, sy uh, systemic envenomation, neurotoxicity, which was reversed with the antivenom, King Cobra antivenom, but he succumbed to the sepsis. All right. Right. So, in terms of demography, uh, again, uh, you know, because of uh, maybe uh, exposure to the outdoors. Uh, exposure to uh, certain jobs, uh, males are more, uh, I think, uh, prominent. I think it's the same anywhere else as well. Uh, and But the thing is, the difference is that in Malaysia has moved from being a fully agricultural country mainly to a more industrial country, and therefore some practices has already changed, uh, especially in the uh, agricultural sector, where many things are now no small farmers anymore mostly are just now conglomerates of farming uh, community and they employ modern techniques of farming. And therefore, we do see a uh, reduction uh, in terms of, we always associate snake bite with what? Occupational hazard, right? But in Malaysia, we don't see that. We see that you, you, a lot of people just accidentally get beaten from home, going out of the car. Imagine the first thing that you step on was a snake as you come out of the car, that's really shocking, right? And when we had this case where a Malayan pit viper bite, 
uh, a patient as he was going out of the car in front of the emergency department of a hospital. So that's very close to the hospital now. That's a very strategic place to get beaten by a snake, I think, right? So, uh, yeah, so that, that, that's very important when we are doing certain study, like, for example, epidemiological study, we have to know what was the situation of the country before and how is it progressed over time? Has it changed? How is that uh, uh, so-called maybe economic situation has changed the pattern of snake bite in the country? In Malaysia, we have already seen this. We are seeing this now. Okay, so uh, in terms of body part, this also will reflect the activities of the patient. Uh, if it is not uh, agriculture or agricultural base, uh, then you will see maybe those using the hands are more uh, involved than also the legs, which is maybe more accidental rather than, uh, you know, doing something uh, active with the hands. Uh, so uh, mind you, it's not only, uh, this is very so-called broad general overview, but uh, you have to understand different species of snake will have uh, preponderance towards different parts of the body that's bitten. For example, if it's a cobra bite, mostly it's the leg, uh, but the Malayan pit viper, also the leg, but the green pit vipers are mainly in the hands because it's arboreal. So you tend to, you know, use your hand to grab everything. It's higher up on the ground, therefore the hands are more prominent. Uh, we see this also when we did our study on pit viper bites, uh, it's mainly upper limbs, uh, cobra bites mainly in the lower limbs. Okay. Uh, this is just a, a summary so that we have, a very short, uh, this five-year period. We find that the non-venomous snakes and venomous snakes, what are the common ones? Uh, this is very much uh, for Malaysia. Different country will have uh, different uh, snake species. I will not dwell on, dwell on this. This is a venomous snake in Malaysia, as Dr. Um, Ashikin mentioned yesterday. Uh, Malaysia has a high rate of cobra bites. Uh, we have also the green pit viper bites, pit, pit viper bites, but the one here in the middle, Tropidolemus subandulatus. This is mainly in the uh, Borneo, uh, Sabah and Sarawak state. Uh, it's not present in the peninsula Malaysia, uh, but they have because we receive a lot of consultation from Sarawak, so there are number of cases uh, mainly from the Tropidolemus subandulatus. Question is, it's a pit viper but it's a very special pit viper. It's one pit viper which we do not need antivenom. So we've done a study, I've shared the paper this morning in our group. Uh, you can read about it. Uh, uh, but it is present, the name in our uh, category two WHO uh, for antivenom development for Malaysia. So we, uh, we've done the study. Uh, we feel that that should be removed from the category two when we, we have a nomination for a better uh, suitable candidate to replace that. Okay, so that is another thing that we have discussed with here. Uh, maybe we should revise, so we do a certain revision of uh, what we mean by category one and category two snake for each country in ASEAN. Okay, um, Lane P. Viper is big, big up there as well. Okay, uh, besides that, uh, being a uh, I wouldn't say a uh, uh, um, rich country, but people have fats. <laughs> uh, it's a crazy thing. People don't just collect local stuff, but they collect uh, exotic stuff. I'm not sure about India and so on, but uh, in Malaysia, they tend to import also uh, illegally uh, uh, through the pet trade, uh, foreign snakes. I mean, uh, illegal, illegally obtained. And uh, they are not just snakes, they are venomous snakes and dangerous snakes. Of all uh, the cases that we had so far, uh, we had two cases of rattlesnakes, one diamondback and one uh, cane break uh, from the US, uh, rattlesnakes. Uh, both cases required antivenom. Uh, we didn't have antivenom. So what we did was we sourced uh, from the region. So we know that Singapore Zoo had a collection of uh, world snakes and they are responsibly keep the antivenom for those snakes. So we have a very good communication. We have a good uh, relationship. And we just call them and then they say, okay, you can uh, loan us the money. It's not for free, of course. Uh, <laughs> it's very expensive, but we have already so-called like established a system uh, for support for those who really need uh, in the region. And we are working with 
uh, of course, uh, the QSMI uh, in Bangkok and also Siam Serpentarium. The other cases uh, is um, uh, one is Trimerosaurus flavo maculatus from the Philippines, our neighboring country, but they trade this snake, pit viper, uh, on Facebook, uh, social media. It's crazy out there. You know, and, and you do, do you know how they, they, they smuggle it in? I'm not going to teach you now, but I'm just telling you how to, what they did. What they did was they smuggled it in, in a box and they declared it as food item. You know, Asian being Asians, you know, we eat everything that moves, right? So, uh, and, and but then they, that's how they do it. They pack it and they declare it as a food item. You know, it's really crazy. And the last case that we had quite recently was last year. Unfortunate uh, incident where this is our first uh, documented uh, foreign snake um, and venomation that caused death, which is from British Sons, and we've published it. Uh, the good thing about uh, the, the, the the good thing about that is that we didn't have the anti venom, but uh, we managed to document the progression of the the whole and venomation quite well, and we've published it. You, uh, if you want, I can share it with you later. So these are the challenges that we have, not just from our local snakes, but also uh, possible foreign snakes as well. And we have no idea what they are now in Malaysia. So we use quite a lot of antivenom. Uh, most of the time that requires was from the great pit viper, from the pit viper complex. I think more majority are from the uh, mangrove pit viper, Malayan pit viper, uh, and then of course uh, the uh, other pit, pit vipers from the mountains. Uh, cobra bites uh, requires antivenom here. You can see quite high. Uh, Jakautia, which we use for both. Uh, we have two species of uh, cobra in Malaysia, Najakautia and Najasumatrana. Uh, Najasumatrana is the only one that can spray venom. I wouldn't say spit venom. Uh, and of course, the, pit by, uh, the king cobra. These are number of cases, not number of vials. Okay? Uh, so we've seen over the years, especially the past five to 10 years, um, past five years, the rate of uh, Ophiophagus hana and venomation is re reduced in the country, partly because of our continuous program, uh, educational program for the public, and we we move we also call we ally ourselves with the public uh, uh, groups so that they can actually change their modus op operandi. As a you know, showing you know, in in Asia you go to Thailand, they play with snake and music and so on. Uh, we move that kind of modus operandi of how they operate to an educational side, and we are now encouraging our public to go herping as well. So herping means that we don't bring the animal out of the wild. You want to see them, you follow the group into the jungle at night, see them live, take pictures, but don't bring them out. Okay, so that is a good thing that we're seeing now in terms of uh, educating our public. So before I end, I think I just give this pearls. Not all snakes are venomous and dangerous to humans. Majority of them are very, very beautiful. Uh, we should use that as an ally to help us in our campaign, not just scaring them with all these gory pictures. It's going to be a freak show. <laughs> uh, but uh, use them also to educate the public and generate interest. Uh, to protect them. Uh, not all snake species are present, nor homogeneously, homogeneously distributed in all area habitat also in the country. This ha will have implication in terms of where you stock the antivenom. So that's where like, you know, geographical GIS uh, system will definitely uh, help you uh, better manage uh, which area or hospital require which antivenom. Uh, knowledge of the snake species of medical significance uh, also, plays a role, detailed history, uh, appropriate and timely antivenom. Of course, I will not dwell on that. Dr. Joke has already mentioned very well. And uh, managing significant snake by envenomation can be a lengthy process. Uh, the one that Dr. Yoke showed about the skin changes, that takes how long? One month? The skin changes for the Naja Kautia just now, you, you showed about one month. So, I've shared already a case. Uh, how we need a multidisciplinary approach, uh, including skin grafting as well. Uh, I've shared it in our group. You can have a read. That takes about more than one month. 
Okay, so it takes a long time. So it's not just about managing when the patient in your department, but as a whole, when the patient already gone home, recuperation, occupational health, and so on. Those has to be included in, in when we talk about snake bite, okay? So I think with that, thank you.